we're going to have a church. I don't know about you, I was getting into that. I was going to stand up and start singing that song, and I thought, I'm going to be the only one standing there, and I think I'm a booming idiot. And so I didn't, but man, I wanted to. I love that song by the newsboy. I think it really captures uh, what was going on on that fateful night when Jesus was born. Not any better than the carols, but it was very, very well done. So Luke presents a particular image of Jesus. Luke is a doctor. So he has a particular slant in which he's going to present the Messiah. And that doesn't make it more or less true than the picture that Matthew and Mark and John present. It's just his own slant. And in fact, there's great harmony between the scriptures and they agree with each other. So what happened? What happened when Jesus came? That's what Luke tries to portray to us throughout his book. And in the long, normally Christmas time, we just read the first part of Luke chapter 2 and the birth of Christ, but I wanted to give us a sampling of what goes on in the rest of the book because he presents a powerful image of Jesus as Savior. And this is, a, this is repeated over and over again in the book. Excuse me, just a second. So he presents the picture of Jesus over and over again as Savior. And this is presented over and over again. Look. So, for instance, what happened? But it's when Jesus was on the scene. And what happened when Jesus came on the scene? Well, grace happened. Good happened. Salvation happened. And it happens over and over again in different ways. The paralytic, you remember, who was lowered through the roof. When Jesus was in the house preaching, and the paralytic was lowered through the roof. And Jesus, the first words Jesus says to him are, Son, your sins are forgiven. Or the centurion, who was on his way to Jesus, and he didn't ask Jesus to come to his house. He said, you just say the word, and my servant will be healed. His servant was sick. And Jesus said, I have not seen such faith as, the, as this in all of Israel. That's what I see in the person of this centurion. And the centurion went back to his house and his servant had been healed. Jesus saves. And then there was a sinful woman, probably a prostitute, and she came to Jesus while Jesus was reclining at the table in the home of a Pharisee. And she sort of crashed the party Kind of rude, really. And she crashes the party, and she comes to Jesus, and she begins to anoint his feet with oil and with her tears. And the Pharisee thought this was really rude, though, what she was doing. And actually, it was a little bit rude. But Jesus responded, and he said, you know, I've come into your house, and you haven't given me this, or given me that, or this, and this woman who doesn't really owe me anything, or, you know, she's come, and she's wet my feet, and washed my hair, and washed my feet, and Things like that. And then Jesus makes a statement. He said, He who has been forgiven much is he who loves much. Jesus saves. Then there was a demon possessed man, gathering the demoniac, and he was crazy. He was out of his mind. He was possessed by demons, possessed by more than one demon. Jesus, what's your name? He said, Our name is Legion, for we are many. And he went around unclothed and acting crazy and wild, and he couldn't keep him chained, and people were afraid of him. And they didn't know what to do. And he came to Jesus, and Jesus cast the demons out. And then the rest of the village came and saw. And when they came and saw the man later, they saw him clothed, seated at Jesus' feet, in his right mind. And then, there was the rebellious son. You know, the prodigal, the rebellious son who left his father's house and went to a faraway land and squandered all he had of his inheritance. And he said the Bible says he squandered it on loose women and wild living. And then he's destitute and by himself and lonely and afraid and broke and he doesn't know what to do and he doesn't have a home. And he said, I think I'll go home to my father's house. And I, was, I would plead my case with him and say, Father, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. 
make me one of your hired servants. That's all I ask. Just take me back in. And the Bible says the father saw the boy coming from a long way off and went and greeted him. And he said, come, let's, let's kill the fatted calf. Let's party like we've never partied before because this son of mine who was lost has now been And there was a story that Jesus told of the tax collector. We don't know if it's an actual person or not, but Jesus told the story of the tax collector and the Pharisee who were going to the temple one day. And as they were going to the temple, the Bible says the Pharisee was glad and comfortable in his own skin in the temple and kind of full of himself and said, I, you know, I thank you that I give, and I thank you that I tithe, and I thank you that I fast, and I'm glad I'm not like this tax collector over and Jesus said there was that tax collector who, as they approached, wouldn't even come into the temple. Wouldn't even look up to heaven, but beat his chest and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, which one of those two guys do you think went home right with God that day? It was the tax collector. The one with a repentant heart and a broken spirit. God loves a contrite spirit. Then there was another tax collector. This really happened. It was Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, a wee little man, a wee little man was he? You know that song when you were kids and playing in Sunday school and whatnot? All right, you shouldn't know it if you don't. If you don't, we're going to have you up here and give you 39 lashes. So. Anyway. so Zacchaeus was short, but he wasn't short on cash. He was just short. And he was a crook. And he heard that Jesus was coming to Jericho, and so he gets up in a tree so he can see him. And Jesus sees him up in the tree, and Jesus stops, and he says, What are you doing up there? And he says, Zacchaeus, I want you to come down. I want to come to your house today. And by the way, i got 12 others who are dinner guests as well. And Jesus goes to Zacchaeus' house to have dinner. And when it's over, Jesus says, Salvation. Zacchaeus, by the way, says, you know, I'm, he is so touched, he's repentant. Jesus evidently got through to him with the gospel, and Zacchaeus says, I'm going to give half of what I give the poor, I'm going to make restitution to those that I ripped off, and for now on this is what I'm going to do. And Jesus says, salvation. Today, salvation has come. And I am changed. 
from the inside out because Christ is there. And where he lives and his influence is seen and felt and experienced, real lifestyle change takes place. And not only that, but when you invite him in and he takes over your world, then he reorders your world. He reorders it and gives it order according to the will of God, the peace of God, the truth of God, the living sensibleness of God becomes your life because you are in touch with the one who has given it to you. So what happens from now on out? What happens from here on out? Well, that's up to you. It's really up to you. I mentioned this a little bit Thursday night. But since Jesus came, we now have a choice. Wait a minute. I, I thought I was already okay in my natural state. I thought, you know, I'm a good person. I don't hurt anybody. I don't cuss very much. I thought I was, I, 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 I thought I'm okay. I thought I'm okay. No, no, you're, you're not okay in your natural state. The Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And in our natural status, we're not okay. Well, so the question, if I'm not okay, can I be okay? Can I be right with God? There's no more important question than that in all of the right with God. There's no bigger question than that. And listen, I don't want to disparage the other religions, but we need to understand something. They cannot make you right with God. Let's, let's just, let's just, this is maybe why Christianity isn't real popular, because it stands out as the only one that can get the job done and the other people resent it. But I don't want to disparage other religions, but the fact is this, none of them, none of them can make you and me right with God. Jesus said, So can I be right with God? Yeah, you can. It's available. But what? Not automatic. And this is what a lot of people just don't, un don't understand. They think they're just automatically okay. But we're not automatically okay. We must Upon what we know would be true. Jesus calls us. It's one of the reasons I love that grace outline, because we've got to see it's a call, because Christ calls us. That Christ has put a call on your life and my life. Christ calls each and every person to come to him. But we must act. He's a gentleman. He's not going to make us do it. We must turn away. I'm trying to make life work the way you want to make it work. And give your life to Jesus. And if we do that, then we can be saved. But it's something we must personally, we must personally receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. And nobody can do that for you. When I was a child, I was sprinkled in the Methodist church and my parents sent me there as a baby and they sprinkled me in the Methodist church and they said, there, that ought to do it. Well, that didn't do it. By the time I was 13, they realized that didn't do it. Because it can't do it. It's something that I must respond to the initiative that the Holy Spirit put in my life. I must respond to Jesus personally and make a 
personal commitment to Him. And there's some, that's something that nobody can do for you. It's something that you and I must each do. The Christian faith is always personal. Listen, it's never private. It's not private, but it's always personal. It's something that you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and I, each of us, must personally respond to Christ in submission and obedience and baptism and discipleship. There's a man on the roof. You've heard the story, maybe. If you've been in church for a while, you might have heard this and just kind of play with me or just tolerate me. So, so there was a man on the roof. There was a flood. The flood was rising. He was on the roof. He knew that something was going to happen. He prayed to the Lord for the Lord to help him. And so here come along a, a boat. They threw him a life preserver. And he said, no, I don't need that. The Lord's going to save me. And so they went on. And pretty soon here come a rowboat. And the rowboat pulled up to him and said, come on, get in and we'll save you. No, 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 you don't understand. The Lord's going to save me. And then pretty soon here comes the helicopter and it drops the basket down and said, get in the basket. And he goes, no, thanks, the Lord's going to save me. And what happened? He drowned. And he said, Lord, I thought you were going to save me. And the Lord said, I sent you a life preserver, a rowboat, and a helicopter. What more do you want? We have to respond. And so I hope, friends, from this year to the next, we're kind of in that never, never land between, you know, between one year and the other, you know, we're wrapping up the old year and going into the new one. And I hope that as we transition from this year into the next, I hope if you have not already, and maybe today, or very soon, you, if you have not done so yet, you will resolve to give your life to Christ. Because Jesus saved us. Let's stand. Let's pray.